So our topic for this morning is open worship. And I'm going to take sort of as a theme verse, 1 Chronicles 16, 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So open worship is in some senses a uniquely brethren characteristic. It's something that really started with the brethren movement, has been adopted by other groups. Um, but yeah, what is open worship? <clears throat> and why do we actually have it? Oh, and how do we actually operate with open worship? So one of the aspects of open worship is everyone participates. Why does everyone participate? So Revelation chapter 1, verses 5, the last half of 5 and verse 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are all priests. Here John's writing and prophesying and saying, Jesus has freed us. And not only has he freed us, but we have been made a unique kingdom, a unique family, that we are priests to God, who all glory and dominion is due. So, we have communal worship because we are a kingdom of priests. We're not just individual priests. Worship can be individual. You can individually, each of us, worship God in our own time, on our own, <clears throat> or on our own. But there is also a communal aspect to worship that we are a kingdom, we are a family, that we should, as a group, communally come together to worship. And from the perspective of how we actually operate our open worship services, we say it's communal worship, all our priests, everyone participates. But we also then talk about the idea of contribution that everyone participates in worship to God during the open worship service. And then we say any Christian man may contribute publicly during the open worship service. And so we would say a uh, man who is a Christian who has professed their belief in Jesus Christ, has been baptized to demonstrate publicly their belief, is then able to participate. And the reason we say limiting it to men is from 1 Timothy and other chapters. There's also chapters in Corinthians, but one is 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 8, Paul states, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And then <clears throat> skipping on to verse 11, let a woman learn quietly all, with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And a while ago, I actually spoke on sec, or 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the point here is women are meant to be participants in the body of Christ. Women are meant to exercise their gifts, but God has also set up a particular set of roles for men and women. And in relation to the church, he has set up men in roles of authority and women are to be submissive. 
And it's actually really more about the roles of authority and submissiveness rather than anything uniquely discriminating against men or dis discriminating against women. It's around there needs to be a proper order of things. There needs to be an exercise of authority that in our open worship service, we say anyone, any man may contribute publicly. And doing so is then exercising a role of authority, that you're exercising a role of authority in helping lead the community in worship. And so because of that exercise of authority, and because of what the scriptures say about the role of men and women in the church and the role of authority, we say that we limit public contribut contribution to men. But everyone is to participate. That the open worship services is not a passive service. It's not a service in which you sit and wait for something to happen. Everyone is meant to be actively participating that it is a time for reflection. It's a time for prayer. It's a time for silent reflection. It's a time to take the leading from others and to reflect on that and to worship God and to direct your thoughts towards God. So as communal worship, it's all around everyone worshiping together with a few men publicly contributing, helping to direct and lead the congregation in a particular direction. So that idea of direction. With the open worship service, there isn't a set order where we say, oh, Kevin is going to speak first, and then Trevor, and then Josh, and then we'll have Ellen close. We don't have a set plan that we say that the open worship service is an opportunity for the entire community to express worship to God. It's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to lead. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Again, starting from the second half of verse 18, going through to verse 21. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the passage is not specifically about the open worship service, it's about Christian life in general, but we take from it a model that we then apply in the open worship service, that we're to be filled with the Spirit. We're to address one another, we're to mention psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, we're to sing, we're to make melody. Oh, Make melody to the Lord in your hearts. So this is we contribute and participate verbally by singing. But we also contribute and we sing or make melody or pray or compose poems silently within our own hearts as our own con contribution to the worship individually. So we say <clears throat> we're to be filled by the Spirit so we can be led by the Spirit. And this is so that we can demonstrate the unity of the body of Christ, that we are one body. In Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If one has complaint, a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, 
which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Paul, in a number of his epistles, talks about we are not just the family of God, we are a body. We are, as a church, Christ's representative here on earth. And in other epistles, Paul talks about how each member contributes to the body. And so the leading of the Holy Spirit allows each of us to participate in open worship, allows each of us to use the skills, talents, and gifts that we have to contribute to the whole body's worship. And the idea that we're led by the Holy Spirit <clears throat> implies that there is some direction. And that we expect that there will be a theme, that the Holy Spirit is going to direct us in thinking about some particular aspect about God and or Christ and his work. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. And let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophet are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. That Paul's writing to the Corinthians. And He's talking specifically about their activities as a church and in relation to their exercise of the gift of tongues and prophecy. But the focus here is that there is order, there is direction, and it's all for a purpose. Let all things be done for building up. That tongues were a sign not necessarily something of application in the modern church. Prophecy can be viewed as exposition. And he's clearly saying, we don't want everyone getting up and rushing about talking about their own things. That there should be only a few who get up. There should be those who listen and hear and contemplate on what they have heard during the service. And you may have come into the service with thoughts and ideas and directions. And then you can see through what other people have contributed that the leading of the Holy Spirit has led the meeting in a different direction. And so you can sit and contemplate on the message and on the theme and on God's work and not necessarily need to share exactly what you were thinking about prior to the service. At other times, you'll have been thinking about something prior to the service and you'll see that it fits into the theme or you can see how it is complementary to the theme. And so then in turn, you should 
share what you have been thinking on and share it with the congregation. So we're to be led by the Holy Spirit. We are to allow the Holy Spirit to direct our worship. That we're to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. So why do we run an open worship service? Well, because we're called to worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, <clears throat> is very famous. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That I started with saying, in the open worship service, all participate because we are all called to worship. That worship is living out God's character here on earth. So all aspects of our lives should worship God. The open worship service is just one opportunity to contribute to worshiping God. It's an opportunity to contribute communally to worshiping God as God's family and as his kingdom of priests. But our lives themselves should be acts of worship. And this topic has been sort of purposely set towards the end of our series on doctrine. Because we've had a number of people speak on different doctrinal topics. And many times it has come back to characteristics of our lives that lead to worship, of the need to live righteous and holy lives as God's people who are worshiping him here on earth. So the idea here is worship leading is not a spiritual gift. If you work your way through the spiritual gifts in the Bible, there are many gifts that are mentioned. But leading worship is not one of them. Worship is a responsibility of everyone. It's not a gift. It's a responsibility. And each as priests are responsible for worshiping God. And men with authority in the church are responsible for leading in worship. That it's not a role that a specific person should take on. It's a role that the church itself should take on. That we are responsible for worshiping God. So we worship and have an open worship service because we are a kingdom of priests who are called to worship. But we also worship because God is God. He is worthy of worship. In Psalm 29, David says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. We worship because God is due worship. We worship in the splendor of holiness. In that, God has made us holy that we are sanctified through Jesus' blood. So we can worship because God views us as holy priests. And in our worship, we worship not just God because he is worthy, we worship his work, and particularly the work of Christ. And so Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we worship because God is worth worshiping. We worship him for the work he has done through Christ. We worship Christ because God has exalted Christ and every name or everyone is 
to bow and worship Jesus, whether voluntarily now or forcibly in front of the judgment seat of Christ. But every tongue will confess that Jesus is God, and it's to the glory of God. So we've said this idea that we are priests. And Revelation 1 was saying <clears throat> we are a kingdom of priests. In 1 Peter, he builds on this. In chapter 2, starting at verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That as priests, we are responsible for worshiping God. And as Peter says, we're to offer spiritual sacrifices. That was living lives that are worshiping God, living lives of righteousness and holiness, serving God in sacrificing our lives to God as our acceptable service. But then also, we're to pro proclaim the excellencies of him. We're to proclaim God's glory and excellence and power and strength and love and his many other characteristics were to proclaim or worship God for who he is. So we are a nation of priests. We are individually called to worship through our lives, but we're also called to communally worship together. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since you have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, the, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day draw nearing. So in Hebrews, we're clearly told we are to gather together. And we're told we are to gather in confidence that we can enter the holy places before God that we have been cleansed. So we're to stir up one another to love and worshiping and to good works. So we have an open worship service as one of our distinct characteristics of the Brethren movement. <clears throat> we have it because we are called to worship. We have it because called to communally worship together. So how do we run an open worship service? So I've said, and you have all observed, we don't have a set plan. We don't lay down, these are the people who are going to share something in the open worship service. This is what they're going to say. We are led by the Holy Spirit. We allow God to work through us. 
but that does require preparation. And it needs to start with introspection. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, I'm just trying to find my copy of it. There it is. <clears throat> Starting at verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That Paul's specifically writing about communion. But communion is an act of worship. It's a part of worship. And we and most brethren churches tend to hold communion within the open worship service. But the introspection applies to worship in general. We are to examine ourselves. We can't worship if we're not right with God. We can't worship if we're not right with each other. And introspection comes with a warning, but the act isn't meant to be, go examine yourself so that you can decide that you are not worthy to participate. Introspection is meant to lead to confession and then transformation. Introspection identifies issues in our lives that would hinder our ability to worship. So we then, do something about it. Make ourselves right with God. Make ourselves right with each other so we can participate in worship. Because in John 1, 1, we have the very famous verse, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That a part of preparing for the open worship service is to inspect our lives and deal with issues and sin in our lives and confess and God will cleanse us so that back in Hebrews we can draw near with a true heart because our hearts are clean and our lives are to be transformed in Romans 12 again In verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That again, that's meant to be applied to our whole lives and living out our lives. We're not to be conformed to this world, we're to be transformed. But if we're transformed, that enables us to live a life of worship, to act as priests to continue to serve him and to worship him and to lead in worship and to participate in worship. So we all must prepare. And a part of the preparation was introspection, <clears throat> which leads to confession and renewed transformation. <clears throat> but another part of preparation is looking into God's word and praying. So there's many verses that talk about studying the Bible and praying to God. An example, Psalm 119, verses 11 and 12. Actually, 15 and 16. Not sure why I wrote 11 and 12. Um, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So in preparation for the open worship service, we all are to spend time with God. We can't worship God if we're not familiar with him. We can't worship God as priests if we don't have a good relationship. We develop that relationship through studying the Bible and praying and serving.
So the focus of an open worship service, focus of worship should be, we are focusing on God. The intent of worship is declaring God's worth. <clears throat> so we should be focusing on God's attributes and work. That can be attributes from the Bible, work from the Bible, and work in God working through things now in the present. We're to remember Christ's death and resurrection as an important aspect of God's work. And as I said, we link communion into the open worship service. So communion is meant to remind us of Christ's death and resurrection. So an important part of worship is remembering his death and resurrection, remembering that we have been saved thanking God for saving us, thanking him for his redemptive work. And we should be anticipating Christ's return, that an important part of God's work is the completion of his work. That if you go back throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testament, much is made of the day of the Lord. There is much focus on the completion of God's work. And so we can worship God in anticipation of Christ's return and the completion of his work. So we can worship God for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. So participation. Everyone participates. And we participate both emotionally and intellectually. In Deuteronomy, we have the Shema, starting at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. But God calls us to love himself. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our might. That's both emotional and intellectual. We are to be entirely caught up in the worship. So, how do we do this? We've said that we're led by the Holy Spirit. So we ask God to reveal the theme to us. That how we particularly operate is we do start with having someone prepare in advance, pray, trust in God to reveal a theme, and then we let others contribute and build on that theme. So we're to ask God for his help to see the theme, we're to listen to what others contribute. We're to see how each person's contributions build on the theme. And we ask God to see how our own preparation fits in. That we don't expect that you can walk into an open worship service, not have thought about God for the last week, not have read the Bible, not have prayed, and then mystically be able to suddenly see God's theme and participate. You can only contribute and participate by spending time with God, by preparing. And you'll have ideas and thoughts from your time with God during the week. And then listen to what others are contributing and saying. Listen to the songs. Listen to the prayers. Listen to the readings. And see how what you have been thinking about over the last week in your time with God fits in with the theme. So we're to focus on God and focus on the theme that is revealed by the Holy Spirit. And back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. 
for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And discerning the body is really being aware of what the body is worshiping. Because we had verse 27, which was already talking about, if you're unworthy, you're guilty. But now if you participate, but without discernment, without seeing how you are contributing to the meeting, if you're not letting the Holy Spirit lead the meeting, then you're hindering worship, and that will bring judgment. So we said all participate, and some men will contribute publicly. The contribution, as I've just said, needs to be focusing on God and on the theme revealed by the Holy Spirit. And it can be reading something from the Bible. It can possibly be expanding on that and expounding on it. But it can be just read something from the Bible. It doesn't need necessarily to be expanded upon. We can trust that God's word is probably more profound than our own. And sometimes it is good just to read and say nothing. But sometimes you're prompted to explain or expand on what you've read to link it into the theme. We can pray. And prayers are going to be prayers of thanksgiving and praise and worship, focusing again on God, his character, and his work, and on Christ's work and Christ's role in salvation and on the theme revealed by the Holy Spirit. You can suggest a song, something that seems to fit in with the theme of the meeting, that we can contribute something that we have heard or which we have sung in the past and which we know and which we can see how it links into the meeting. Oh, we can contribute by being silent. There was a temptation to title the slide, Silence is Golden. That worship is everyone participating, which means there actually does need to be moments of silence, moments of allowing people to think, to reflect on what has just been shared, allowing people to think and reflect on how they may contribute. And the focus is on God. It's on worshiping God. It's not about delivering sermons. It's about sharing something that God has revealed. So we should keep our contributions short. So we say the open worship is led by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is both mysterious and not mysterious. It's mysterious in that it is literally God working through us. It's literally allowing God to use us. But it's not mysterious. It's not some special ecstatic state. It's not some special feeling of the Holy Spirit filling your life in some new and unique way. It's expressing your love and worship to God. It's based on our preparation and participation. That if we have been actively thinking about the theme throughout the open worship service, then it's much easier to see how the things we have been thinking about previous to the service things we have been thinking about and thinking on and reflecting on in our own communion with God individually during the week 
it's easier to see how that fits into the theme. So for actively participating, listening, focusing on God and the theme, it's easier to see how you do have something to share. And as I've said, we usually link communion in with the open worship service because communion is a natural component of worship. We're celebrating God's act of redemption. So back in 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, we have a command from Jesus himself that we are to have a communion act, that we're to break bread and share a cup. And we're to do that in remembrance of him, in remembrance of his body being broken, in his blood being shed for the redemption of our sins. And we're to continue doing it until he returns. So we need a place to do communion. We need a place and a time where we can regularly remember Christ's work, which is why we link it to the open worship service. It's an act of worship, which we're commanded to do frequently. So worship is not passive. We're not to sit in the open worship service waiting for something to happen were to be actively engaged in the service. We're not to be led by others. That we are all responsible for worship. You will at times take authority to lead as directed by the Holy Spirit, seeing how things you have been thinking about fit into the theme of the meeting, but it's not a unique calling. It's not something where we have a worship leader for the church. That many people have commented in the past in terms of revivals. That revival starts with conviction and leads to prayer, devotion, and active worship. And again, people have made the comment that churches that have fallen astray, have become weak, have delegated responsibility away from the congregation to others. So worship is active in glorifying God. And it's an important communal practice that when I was in Canada, I helped contribute to the research that someone I knew was doing their PhD in the history of Christianity in Western Canada. And one of his observations was churches go in cycles. And if churches are not renewed, the cycle leads downwards and downwards away from God. Because a typical trend is you have an active congregation actively pursuing God, worshiping God, and serving God. And then you have professionals leading the church in serving God and worshiping God and everyone follows and participates. 
And then you have professionals who take over doing everything and the church stagnates. Without active participation by the body of Christ, the church stagnates and dies. That there's a number of denominations in North America that were amazingly evangelical denominations a century ago, and which are really mere social clubs now. Because people lost their active participation. We need to actively worship, which involves service. We are all called to worship. We're all called to be priests. And we all need to contribute in our own ways to worshiping God. And as I've already said, men may actively publicly contribute, but everyone actively worships during the open worship service. Men and women both think and reflect on God's worth during the service. Men and women silently reflect and pray to God. And some men will get up and say something publicly to help direct the service towards our focus on the theme and on God's glory. So let's remember that as we have a time of open worship in a few moments. And we just close this section in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you are a God who is worth worshiping. We thank you that you have called us as priests. We ask that you help us to live as priests. Help us to dwell on your work. Help us to serve you and worship you. Help us to see how we can contribute to our worship for you. In Jesus' name, amen.